Hello, everybody. It is my great honor and pleasure to announce the lecture by Professor Sir Roger Penrose. He will tell us why solving the singularity problem of general relativity is not just a problem of quantum gravity. We have a small request for all participants. Please, let's reserve all the questions to the end of the talk, okay? Okay, Roger, please, one hour. Thank you very much. Well, no, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be able to give this talk. I hope it's not a disappointment to people who think they've solved quantum gravity, but uh, let me continue with, with the talk as I see it. Now, I'm trying to get these things to work. Okay, now you see the two great revolutions of 20th century are quantum mechanics and general relativity. Physics revolutions, I should say. And uh, they are separate theories which don't really have much connection. However, uh, there are ways of treating the intersection between the two. What normally thinks of quantum mechanics as dealing with small things and general relativity is dealing with large things, but there is an interplay between the two, which I want to address. There are many approaches to dealing with the intersection or dealing with general relativity by means of quantum mechanics. Ideas originally due to Feynman and Bryce DeWitt and other people using techniques of Feynman diagrams, quantum field theory, so we're uh, trying to deal with general relativity according to the methods of quantum field theory. You can do quite a deal, good deal this way, but it doesn't really get you terribly far if you want to talk about things like black holes and you get divergences and awful problems like that. You can have the issue the other way around. There's a bit of delay I've played on my key, so I hope, <laughs> yes, the other way around, where you are trying to deal with quantum mechanical issues within the framework of general relativity. So you're doing quantum mechanics and curved backgrounds. Again, there is a certain progress in this area. I think the most important contribution in this area was uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, dis uh, discovery that black holes radiate. And well, usually that one of the problems with trying to do quantum mechanics in quantum field theory and curved backgrounds is you don't have any back reaction on, you can do your quantum mechanics, but it doesn't back react on the structure of the curvature of space time. Well, in, in Stephen Hawking's discussion of the evaporation of black holes, you artificially back react on it by saying that it loses energy and therefore the black hole gets smaller. I'll come back to the issue of the evaporation of black holes, which will be important in what I want to say at the end of the talk. But for the moment, uh, let's move onwards and consider what happens with a full theory which combines both. There are all sorts of approaches, string theory perhaps being the most familiar to people, loop variables, foams, all sorts of things, ideas. Uh, I should point out that these things would be all to do with things very far from experimental tests. So whatever you may think of these particular approaches, they're certainly not at a stage where you could test them experimentally. I want to talk about things which are more directly to do with observation. In fact, I want to address the issue in a slightly unusual way. We have these two subjects. I want to address them in relation to the problems that each theory has. In the case of quantum mechanics, what I regard as the main problem, you have divergences and things like this, with quantum field theory, but the main problem in my view is a measurement problem. You see a cartoon at the top on the left-hand side of a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. So it's a sort of anecdote of a Schrodinger cat. I will come back to this right at the end because I think there is an issue, I could give the whole talk on that subject, how general relativity should be influencing quantum mechanics and maybe resolving the issue of the measurement problem. That's not my talk today. However, I will say something about it at the end. The main thing I want to say is the question of the singularities. So this is a problem of classical general relativity, that you have the singularities in black holes and in the Big Bang, 
And how does one treat these things? It seems that quantum mechanics comes to the rescue. So the normal idea is you imagine that curvatures get enormously large. Therefore, the radii of curvature get ex extremely tiny. And these radii may get down to the Planck scale of whatever it is, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, uh, things like that. So you're looking at, at ridiculously small scales of time and of space. Um, I do want to address this issue. That's basically the main point of my talk. But whether it can be addressed simply by having a theory which could uh, view quantum gravity theory, I want to say that I don't think that is the answer. I mean, maybe it's, it will be part of the general answer when we find a solution, but I want to address things from a somewhat different point of view. The point of view which I want to address is has to do with, well, let me talk about the curvature of space-time first. This is an illustration of the vial curvature of space-time. Here you imagine a sphere of particles and then you, this, this object can be an orbit around the Earth and the, you, you can cancel out the uh, gravitational uh, attraction field, at least the first order. Uh, but the second order, you have to worry about the, the differences. You imagine that the central point is moving in orbit and so it doesn't feel any gravity. But then if you imagine surrounding that point by a sphere, then there will be a, a, an acceleration inwards on the horizontal side, on the vertical side, there's an acceleration outwards. Initially, the volume of the sphere will be preserved. This is, this is pure vacuum, and this is an effect of the vial curvature. So I want to be talking about the vial curvature. This is the part of the curvature, which, well, let, let's talk about it here from light rays, what I was just talking about before, where we're looking at particles, and so they're, they're moving along geodesics, time-like geodesics in the space-time. But I want to be more concerned a bit with light rays. And like you, the main fact of the first real test of general relativity was convincing was, of course, the bending of light by the sun. And this has the effect of, if you imagine this sphere of stars, the circle of stars here, imagine, and then they will be displaced outwards because the light rays, as they pass by the sun, get bent around it. And therefore, the, the, it makes a magnification in the outward direction from the sun. Um, sorry, it's, yes, so you get a, a magnification horizontally as it moves out along the, the radial lines from the sun. But since the, it, the, it pushes out more, the nearer you are to the sun, that means you, the circle here will become elliptical shape. So you see, as the rays pass near to the sun, they encounter the vial curvature of the sun, which is this distortion effect, which causes uh, elliptical shapes, circular shapes to become elliptical. So this is just a primitive thing. Here I have a more space-time picture of what's going on. Here you have an observer looking out to space-time and the vial curvature causes this distortion of space-time, whereas the Ricci curvature, uh, actually the trace-free part if you're looking at the um, null GD6, causing a focus. So you have positive focusing if there's a presence of matter here, like a positive lens, whereas you have a lens which is purely astigmatic, as much focusing in one direction as outwards as there is as focusing inwards in the other direction. So this is characteristic of the vial curvature. And uh, the full curvature separates, there are 20 components at each point of the Riemann curvature, and they separate into 10 components which are directly related to the matter content and the remaining co components are due to the free gravitational field. It's a bit like with Maxwell theory, except that here the differential orders are the same rather than Maxwell theory, they're different. See, in the case of Maxwell theory, you have the free Maxwell field, and that is the analog of the vial curvature, whereas you also have the charge current vector, which is the analog of the Ricci curvature. And here they're both curvatures, they're the same differential order, Whereas in the case of Maxwell's equation, they're not at the same differential order, but it's a use, useful comparison. You think of the, the, the uh, uh, charge um, current vector as being to do with like the Ricci part and the 
um, Maxwell Field is to do with the vowel path. And there are a lot of similarities when you write things out, particularly in, in two spinner form. I won't do that here, but that's certainly the way I came across these things first. Okay, well, here's the problem as I see it. If you want to think of the re resolution of space time singularities as being purely a matter of quantum gravity, suppose you had a quantum gravity theory, which was a quantum theory in the ordinary sense, then this quantum theory would be time symmetrical. And what you find about the singularities is something very, very different from that. The, in the, the general situation of a collapse, I'll talk about these things in a little more detail in a minute, but the general collapse, you expect to see the vial curvature simply diverging to infinity. It becomes wilder and wilder and, and goes to infinity. Whereas in the Big Bang, you find the opposite. The vial curvature seems to go right down to zero, very, very small. And the restriction on the vial curvature to become very small is something I want to talk about. It's all related to the second law of thermodynamics in a very important way. But just the theory of quantum gravity, it's very hard to see how you get this very, very different. If it's supposed to explain the nature of the Big Bang, why is it so different from if it's supposed to explain the singularities in gravitational collapse? I should explain that the... Oh, I can't, I can't, I'll come back to this in a minute. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. Now, this is a cartoon of what we currently understand to be a picture of the universe. Time is going up the picture, as it normally does in my pictures. We have the Big Bang at the bottom and the expansion uh, according to Einstein's general relativity. But eventually we get this exponential expansion, which um, at the turn of the century, the observations seem to be indicating that we have this exponential expansion. I've always regarded this as a confirmation of the existence of a positive cosmological constant. I remember going to conferences very often and uh, they would be saying at the end of this conference, well, maybe by the time of the next conference, we will know whether there is a cosmological constant or not. And uh, when people found what seems to be a cosmological constant, they kept getting very puzzled. This is this mysterious dark energy or something like this. To me, it's just, well, I mean, Einstein introduced the cosmological constant for the wrong reason. He wanted a static universe so that the attraction due to the matter was con compensated by the, the repulsion due to the lambda term. But when you have uh, the lambda term dominating, as it does in this expanding universe, then you just get this exponential expansion, which is quite uh, the expectation, certainly in the days before the, the uh, observations did indicate the presence of a positive cosmological constant or something else causing the acceleration. I should indicate at the back of this picture, I have this frilly thing. This is just because I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is spatially open or spatially closed. It's very hard to draw the pictures if it's not spatially, if it's spatially open. So I like to draw it pretending that at least for a while it looks as though it's closed. It's just easier to express what I want to say. And then at the back you say, well, maybe it doesn't close up, it maybe keeps on going. It doesn't play any role in what I want to say today, whether it closes up or not. So I am allowing for both possibilities. Now, people won't wonder about the beginning here. You see, the, according to conventional cosmology, I've missed something out in this picture. Well, that's because the, the scale isn't adequate. What you would need is to have a very powerful magnifying glass to see what is happening at the Big Bang. And according to current theory, what you would see would be another exponential expansion. This is the inflationary period. This, of course, up at the top right hand is just the handle of the magnifying glass. It's not some feature of the universe, I make clear. Um, and it's important to realize, well, you see, there are all sorts of reasons that people introduced the idea of inflation. Um, one of them was the to try and get rid of they thin out the monopoles in certain theories, magnetic monopoles, which we don't seem to see. Uh, I'm not sure I regard that as a good reason because you have to believe the theory which predicts it. Um, many ideas, well, one of the reasons that the, you people like to hang on to the inflationary phase is that you have the only explanation that people could provide of the scale invariance of the 
microwave background, you see the temperature variations in the microwave background seem to have this curious scale invariance, which seems to indicate some sort of exponential origin of them. Now, another thing people would regard inflation to be good at was to stretch out the universe. So if it was irregular to begin with, then somehow it would get nice and smooth, and so you have a universe which is something like what we see. Now, I'm trying to argue that that argument doesn't make any sense. And the reason is the following. Let's imagine that my earlier picture turned upside down. And so now time is still going up, but the universe is now collapsing. Now all the equations that one's using for the uh, dynamics will be symmetrical in time, Einstein's equations or the inflaton field or whatever you want to introduce. So this would be just as good a solution as the other. But now I want to imagine there are irregularities in this model. So you have various matter distribution here, which is not regular. And as it gets more and more concentrated and the irregularities get bigger and bigger, we would expect black holes to form and these black holes would run into each other and form one incredible mess at the end. This incredible mess would be much more like the picture I have here. This is supposed to indicate black hole singularities and just ending in some horrible mess. Maybe something like the work that was done by Lifshitz and Kalatnikov. Well, they were the error in their first attempts at this, but in their later work, they corrected for that. And maybe the type of very, very chaotic sort of singularity with vile curvature completely diverging and making a great mess of the end point here in a very complicated but interesting way, which is quite possible. Um, but anyway, that is what one expects. And that would be much more likely than a collapse of that kind. Now, since all these equations are symmetrical in time, we might ask why it wasn't the Big Bang like this. And in fact, you can make an estimate of how much more probable this is than this uh, by looking at the entropy in black holes. And you have the Bekenstein Hawking formula for the entropy, and then you look out how much matter there is in the universe and how many black holes would be formed. So in the collapsing phase, you would say, um, if there were a collapsing phase, then you would have a, a, a big entropy, which tells you how, um, <clears throat> well, something like the improbability of this being collapse resulting in this rather than this would be one part in 10 to the part power of 10 to the power 124, where you take into account the dark matter as well as the material in the universe, and bearing in mind that the entropy is a logarithm, so you take an exponential of that. And so even though the, the entropy is something like 10 to the power 124, you have to take another exponential in order to get the, um, the probability. So the question is, why was the universe not like this? And it was like this. And just putting quantum gravity in, putting in the, in the infraton field doesn't help at all because you can put it in there and the collapse will make a mess like this. Whether you put it in or not, it makes barely any difference whatsoever. It makes a difference only when you're very close to having a Friedman, Robertson, Walker type of model. And so it doesn't get rid of this generic sort of situation. So that's not the explanation. Now I want to look at things well, I, let me first of all stress the, the, the situation. It's not merely that we have something very peculiar. You see, the, the question has to do with entropy and therefore has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics says that as time progresses, entropy increases, more or less. And here I'm having time going from left to right, and the top three pictures represent a gas in a box. And I'm imagining first that there's a little smaller box where the gas is contained in the box. So you open the box up and the gas spreads out. So we see from left to right, entropy increases and uniformity increases. So this is a general picture of what you would expect for material. However, let's in the bottom three pictures, I'm considering not a gas in a box, but I'm considering a galactic scale box with a lot of stars in the, in the box. And you imagine now, as time progresses, gravity tends to clump the stars, they get, the distribution gets clumpier and clumpier, and then you eventually get things like black holes. 
and the entropy just goes shooting up. So in both pictures, we have time from increasing from left to right. In both pictures, we have entropy increasing from left to right. But in the gravitational case, we see that the uniform distribution represents low entropy, and the uniform distribution represents high entropy in the case of most matter or gas in a box, most materials. So there's what we see is a combination of bottom left and top right. We see uniformity. So it's not just that we, when we go back and back in time, we uh, seem to see, um, well, yeah, let me continue the next picture because it's, it's not just what I was saying here, it's even more remarkable because when you go back and see the earlier, earliest observations of what the universe was, direct observations of what the universe is like, we're looking at the cosmic microwave background. I think it was the COBE satellite, and this was the uh, result that they came up with. That you can see, this is the curve where we're looking at the photons, the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is the intensity going up and the, and the uh, frequency going from left to right. And this is the Planck curve, and this, this is what you see. The error bars are magnified by a factor of 500. So if you put the real error bars, you would see it would hug the Planck curve to within, well within the thickness of a line. I think even the last one would be within the thickness of a line. So this is an extremely close confirmation of what? Of maximum entropy. It's not just that this matter is uniform, it's, it's radiation and matter together are maximum entropy. And I always found this very puzzling because you go back and back and back in time until the earliest you see directly, you find that the entropy is a maximum. Whereas entropy should be going up in time. I think people used to worry and say, well, the universe was quite small in those days. So maybe it's something to do with there not being much room. I should just say that's not the answer. It's quite easy to see it's not the answer. The answer is just that it happened to be in, as far as matter was concerned, and matter and radiation, it was very close to be in maximum entropy state. So the matter was not just uniform, it was in a very maximum entropy state. So the paradox is worse than before. You have gravity being the only thing, as far as we can see, which was not thermalized. And it's a very peculiar initial state. Now, that's, you see, I'm trying to say that the uh, inflation doesn't do the trick. Now I want to look at space time from, I hope I'm moving my slide ahead, it didn't seem to move. Why is it not moving? I don't know why it's, ah, no, it's jumped. <laughs> yes, this is the problem I said before. What we seem to see is a very uniform early universe, which is sort of, I used to, I used to play around with the idea that perhaps quantum gravity was a very peculiar kind of theory in which quantum mechanics was modified. In fact, I indicated that right at the beginning, that, that perhaps the collapse of the wave function involves a modified quantum theory in which gravity is involved, and perhaps it's a very time asymmetric theory. And so this time asymmetric theory would explain this very, very curious difference between what the Weyl curvature does in the very universe, early universe, and what it seems to do in the singularities of collapse. Collapse of the singularity of the Big Bang is very different, very, very different. So I thought maybe it was very some strange kind of quantum gravity. Then I just more or less postulated. I just say, well, let's just postulate that the Weyl curvature is zero at initial type singularities, and it can do what it likes in final type singularities without any theory which tells you it should be like that. It's just a hypothesis. So that was my vial curvature hypothesis. Now, that leads us to a picture like that. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Now, I want to talk more about space-time in a little more detail here. Here I have a picture with, of a light cone or a null cone, I should say. At any one point, you have this fundamental structure. We should have four dimensions of space time altogether, so that means three dimensions of space. I'm trying to indicate three space dimensions and one time dimension. And then we have the null cone, which is the most important structure. 
but that's the, not the whole metric. If you want to describe the whole metric, we need to have an additional structure, which are these um, bowl-shaped surfaces and hill-shaped surfaces here, which indicate the actual uh, contribution to the metric from the uh, actual scaling. You see the metric has 10 components, and roughly speaking, nine of them have to do with the light cone or the null cone, and the 10th has to do with the crowding of these surfaces. So the, when I say the 10th, I really mean the, the nine of them are the independent ratios of the 10 components of the metric, and the 10th is the scaling, and that's indicated by these surfaces. So I imagine two particles whizzing through the central origin point here, and when they encounter these different surfaces, that's the ticks of the clocks. So these are two particles which are clocks. And I'm combining the two most famous formulae of 20th century physics. Of course, Einstein z equals mc squared, and Max Planck, Max Planck slightly earlier, e equals h nu. Einstein tells you that energy and mass are equivalent, c just being a translation constant, and Planck telling us that energy and frequency are equivalent, nu being a frequency, where h is just a con conversion constant. You put the two together, and that tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent. And I think this is the most fundamental way of looking at the metric, because it's really hard to, if you want to talk about spatial distances, people usually think of metric in terms of little rulers, but then in order for rulers to measure a distance, you've got to make sure the two ends of it are measured simultaneously, and then you've got to have light signals to tell it simultaneously, and it's really very indirect. Whereas time measures are very, very direct. In fact, any particle, stable, massive particle, is a clock, according to these two famous formulae. Of course, the frequencies are extremely high, so you don't directly use them as clocks, but it's basically, it's really the basis of atomic clocks and nuclear clocks. It comes down to these formulae, which tell you how, how precise they really are. So these two particles, let's imagine they're identical particles, and you can see when they encounter first tick, second tick, well, that's the ticks before the origin point, and then first tick, second tick, third tick, and the blue one, first tick, second tick, third tick, those surfaces uh, tell you the, the scaling of the metric. However, if you just have photons, massless particles, they don't even see these surfaces at all. They're only interested in the null cones, not in the scaling surfaces. So that's the basic structure. And that basic structure of the null cones is not just photons, but any massless particles, it really was massless, uh, gravitational waves, of course, travel a lot along these uh, characteristic surfaces as well. So if you have massless things, they are respecting the uh, st structure. Now, the structure that I want to indicate here is that it's a conformal structure. This is the conformal structure of space-time. And one of the beautiful things about looking at conformal structure <clears throat> is you can talk about infinity in a finite way. Here I have a very beautiful picture due to, with one of several due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher. <clears throat> and this is a representation of hyperbolic geometry. I'm not going to worry about the particular <clears throat> geometry or two-dimensional geometry, which is hyperbolic geometry, but this represents it in a very nice way. It's a uh, construction due to Beltrami, uh, sometimes called the Poincaré disc, but Beltrami had it before Poincaré. I'm not sure Riemann didn't have it before but either of them, but it's an illustration of a representation of, of this uh, hyperbolic plane using a conformal description. And conformal means that although these fish creatures get smaller as you get to the edge, they don't get distorted. Well, you, most particularly small shapes don't get distorted. The angles of their fins here remain completely exactly the same know cl how close to the edge you are. In fact, the eyes, you see they're exact circles and they remain exact circles no matter how close to the edge you get. Yet you can represent the entire plane, the hyperbolic plane in this finite way. So you, you, you can represent infinity. And I've, I've seen the original of this picture and it's really very beautiful, extremely finely done right up to the edge, incredibly accurate in the way she represents it. Now, in space-time, well, it just means you're looking at the null cones. 
That's what you mean by the conformal structure, it's the null codes. And it's the structure which is felt out by massless particles. Okay, now I want to use this trick to squash down infinity. You see infinity out here, because there is a cosmological constant, it turns out, or positive cosmological constant or something equivalent, you find that the infinity is actually space-like. Um, took me a long time to be persuaded that it was space-like because uh, uh, I wasn't sure that I believed the considerations because I had a wrong reason for believing there should be no cosmological constant. But when I got persuaded, I believe by Jerry Ostreicher in particular, and he told me that it's not just the accelerating stars, but all sorts of things in cosmology work much better when you introduce this lambda term. And so I said, okay, <laughs> I believe you. And so then I knew from previous work I'd done that if you have a positive cosmological constant, then the infinity becomes a space-like surface. So it's like a, a time. You can think of the times as sections through this, and this is just time infinity. I used to play around a lot with gravitational radiation in asymptotically flat spaces, and then you have infinity, which is not space-like, it's null. And uh, one can do all sorts of nice things when it's null. You can work out the energy and how much energy is carried away by gravitational waves and Bondi and Sachs and beautiful formulae. And you can have positivity theorems about energy and so on. And all those things you have to think through all over again when you've got a, a positive cosmological constant. But it is very nice in one particular respect. There is a theorem due to Helmut Friedrich which tells you that if you have massless sources, I'm not sure whether it wasn't specifically Einstein-Maxwell theory, but massless sources, you can have a very general situation and you still get a nice smooth infinite boundary. That is a boundary which represents the infinity, the future infinity of this model. So it's a very nice way, very general way of talking about as long as your black holes will, will finally evaporate it away, and you've got nothing left but things with no mass, then it's a good way of talking about infinity by conformally squashing it down and getting this nice smooth boundary. What about the Big Bang? Well, I was certainly aware that if you look at all these standard models of cosmology, you can stretch the Big Bang out and it can a completely converse description to the other and get a nice smooth boundary. Not only do you get that, but they seem to well, let, let me go back for a moment. Um, I used to say that why, what's so special about the Big Bang? Well, the vial curvature hypothesis, which says that the vial curvature goes to zero as you reach the Big Bang. But it's not something you could do much with it. My student at the time of colleague, Paul Todd, uh, had a much better way of looking at it, which was to say, let's postulate that even though it's irregular, it's not a, a general cosmological, smoothed out cosmological model, but let's suppose it's a general situation and you postulate, and just, instead of saying the vial curvature goes to zero, you postulate that you can st stretch out the Big Bang so that it is conformally smooth and you get a boundary in a similar sort of way that you can put a boundary onto infinity. And that is just a condition on the Big Bang, like saying the vial curvature hypothesis. It's not quite as strong in a certain sense. It tells you that the vial curvature is finite at the boundary. It doesn't tell you it's zero, but it's still a very strong restriction. And it seemed to me that was a very good idea. Anyway, I also used to think often in terms of radiation and what light does, and it's very often convenient to look at the, the tensors and the spinners and things at this boundary and do your calculations at the boundary. So you can formally squash it down, you do your calculations of introducing an appropriate conformal factor and then they become finite calculations and you don't have to worry about taking limits and things like that. So it's very handy. And so I was used to that and it was also used to thinking as though you could sort of in principle extend to the other side. It's not a real thing on the other side, but you could imagine your electromagnetic field is swishing across and is therefore nice and regular, and you could do your calculations as though there was an extension on the other side. And you can do the same trick here, 
with Paul Todd's idea, you can stretch the Big Bang out and do calculations about what the initial state would be like by imagining that you could extend your fields to a fictional something prior to the Big Bang. And this is all very well and nice calculations and nothing wrong with doing it this way. In fact, it's also quite nice in another respect. I remember thinking how, much, how rather similar the two ends were. You see, it's not just that the when you, distances become smaller when you squash them down, but the complementary things like the momenta, and for the times gets made smaller, the, the energies get, the, as you squash your space time down, so they get smaller, the, the complementary the objects get bigger. So the, your, your energies get larger and your densities get bigger and as you squash it down. So the, coincident with your squashing down spatially, you're stretching out, let's say magnifying in a compensatory way, your energies and, and momenta. Now the opposite thing happens here, that whereas you're stretching out the Big Bang, so your distances are getting bigger, complementary to that, your energies get smaller and your momenta get smaller. So that something which is infinitely large here and infinitely small here, they become, become something finite. So you could imagine finite energies and, and momenta here. In fact, you could well imagine that they might match. In this way. So I had that idea that they match, perhaps. And then I had a more crazy idea, which is the following that our Big Bang was in fact the continuation of the remote future in the conformal picture. Whereas they seem to be sort of scale and they seem to match. Why not pretend that that is something real? And what about the photons going out? I really was thinking about the universe and how boring it was going to be. It's quite exciting when there are galaxies around. It's still quite exciting when there are black holes around although it gets quite boring because they just become the curse solution. Then you've got to wait and wait and wait and they finally evaporate away with a pop at the end. And then you've got nothing and nothing and nothing. And e eternal boredom. I, I thought that's a really rather depressing kind of picture for our universe. But then I began to think, well, well who's going to be around there? Not us, but mainly photons. And it's very hard to bore a photon because photons, as I indicated prior, they don't experience the passage of time. So from the photon's creation right out to infinity is no time at all for the photon. So it just gets perhaps into the next eon, as I'm calling it, and has a new experience in this new eon. I'm using the word eon, I like to spell it A-E-O-N, for what we would currently think of as our universe, beginning with the Big Bang, and not with any inflation, I should say. The inflation makes the picture uncomfortable because it stretches this out so that the gap between this and the next would be enormous and it would be make it very difficult for anything interesting to happen. Uh, I didn't like inflation anyway, it seemed to me a very artificial idea. And you can see that there is something which maybe could re replace inflation because you have this exponential expansion of the previous eon which could play a role rather like inflation. You're looking through the Big Bang into this previous eon in a certain sense. I'll come back to this looking, looking through business because that's important. In fact, that's the next picture here. Here I'm imagining this line across the middle, the B, this line, is the boundary between the previous eon and the next eon. And I imagine these null cones fit beautifully smoothly from one eon to the next. And uh, light rays, a photon, could get through right across from one side to the other. I should explain an important point, which I didn't mention previously. You see, if there was nothing in the previous eon apart from massless things, then you could say this is perfectly reasonable to squash them down and get something finite. But that's not what you have in our current view of the universe. Okay, the black holes will get rid of a lot and there's nothing but radiation coming out and just, just the end when you might have some massive things, a tiny portion, but you've got things like hydrogen running around. So I introduce a hypothesis and people sometimes say that's the weakest part in the theory, maybe it is. The hypothesis is 
that there is in the very remote future a fade out of mass. And one of the sort of justifications, it's a little bit of hand waving, but it's a sort of justification that when you do particle physics, one of the first things you do is to look at the, the Casimir operators of the Poincaré group. And then you notice that these are mass and spin. So these are things which are supposed to be absolutely conserved. A stable particle would have an absolutely conserved mass and spin. But when you have a lambda term, then you could say that the fundamental group is the de Sitter group and not the Poincaré group. And in this de Sitter group, you find that, the, that mass is not now a Casimir operator. So you, you might expect there's more reason to expect that it's possible over a cosmological scale of times, eventually there may be a fade out of mass. But I say that is a hypothesis. It would need more justification. It would need to even to have a theory of how fast it would fade out. Very slowly it would have to be. But the idea is that you can match this because the mass becomes zero in the remote future. What about the Big Bang? Well, there it's much easier because Everything gets so hot as you close, get close to the Big Bang, energies get so enormous that the mass becomes completely irrelevant. So in fact, the closer and closer that you get to the Big Bang, working your way down from, uh, from the future into the Big Bang, uh, you would find that the mass becomes less and less relevant. So asymptotically, mass becomes zero. So that's reasonable hypothesis. So mass becomes asymptotically zero as you approach the Big Bang, mass becomes asymptotically zero by the mass, mass fade out hypothesis as you approach the infinite boundary. And you would need to make your equations work. There are in fact equations that various people have worked out. I, I worked them out in some way, Paul Todd did in a different way, slightly different. Um, Christoph Meisner, my collaborator has a way of doing it. Uh, other people like uh, Jörg Fraundina, now in New Zealand. So, there are equations, there's a certain amount of freedom in how you do it. And I think that needs to be fixed by some more important hypotheses, which are not fully fixed at the moment. But you can certainly write down equations for which the evolution across from one side to the other is, uh, is smooth. And that would be the idea to do that. Okay. Now, one thing that could get across would be gravitational waves. You can imagine gravitational waves going and you can work out what they would do on the other side. And you have to look at the equations to see that, but they certainly do things. You could imagine photons getting across. The main problem there is that photons on the other side would simply scatter and, and you wouldn't get much of a signal as they get around. But if you have long enough wavelength photons or magnetic fields or things like that, they could certainly get through. And you, that would be certainly a possible observational test of this scheme. The first serious observational test that I had thought of was the following. Now in this picture, this central rectangle is really meant to be a three-dimensional crossover surface between the previous eon and our eon. So this is our eon at the top, this is us here, this vertex of the spoke cone, or the red cone represents our past light cone, going back and hitting the stretched out Big Bang here. And I'm imagining that in the previous eon, there are galactic clusters in which there are supermassive black holes which run into each other, burst of gravitational radiation. We would see the signal in a, in a way, I'll come to it in a minute. Uh, but if it's in the same, same cluster of galaxies, you would see several of these bursts and you might expect to see, um, well, what you would see for one of these would be a ring very faintly in the bottom part of the picture. I've tried to indicate deliberately faintly because they're hard to see. These rings you would see would be the intersection of our past light cone and the future light cone here or, and, and, and the initial, the crossover surface. And that's a, that is a, a, a a ring that you would see. And that ring would be, you can work it out, it would be either of slightly higher or slightly lower temperature as it crosses over. I can't quite remember whether I have this in the next picture, no I didn't. You can, you can see that the, when the signal is coming towards us, the, um, the temperature is slightly raised and that is for the more distant signals. In 
the signal is closer to you, the temperature is slightly lowered. It's the wrong way around from what you normally expect. Never, nevertheless, that, that there would be effect in this nature. You would also see that the temperature variation around the ring would be slightly more uniform. There would be a, a slightly uh, low variance. So this was my colleague Vahe Gurzajan uh, looked at in this way, and he looked for concentric rings. Some other people had looked previously to this and didn't find anything. You had to look in this really rather specific way to, to see the signals, which uh, Vahe apparently did see. I've indicated here, the, he looked first in the, in the WMAP data and seemed to see signals of this nature. Um, we had a way of testing for them by uh, twisting the sky to see whether um, the, the algorithm which spotted them would find so many when you twist the sky because circles become elliptical shapes and then you wouldn't expect to see elliptical shapes. So there is a predominance for a circular shape. So that was the signal that seemed to be there. I want to show you something else here though. This is the later Planck data and these points represent the centers of triples of, sorry, um, why it's going that way. Yes. You see here, I've, I've imagined two. In a galactic cluster, there's one collision and then another one, bang, bang. And so there's one ring and the next ring, and these we provide concentric circles. So what Vahe looked for, well, when you have at least three. So to get a strong enough signal with the low variance, that you get at least three events, then it, the center of them is marked in the in the next picture. So in the this picture, sorry, it's going the wrong way. That's me, my fault here. These spots represent the centers of triples of low variance rings. And you notice they're very clumped, which is rather surprising. Despite the uniformity of the universe, it's not that uniform in a certain sense, because these signals seem to indicate a great clumping. I should imagine, mention that these two central regions are excluded because that's where the galaxy is. So there may be other points here, but they're not represented. You're only looking at uh, outside below this line here and above this line here. Now, the point I want to make is that the red ones are warmer and the blue ones are cooler. Well, that's the wrong way around because uh, the red ones are um, should be <laughs> blue, the blue shift, they're blue shifted, the red ones are blue shifted and therefore they're distant. They're two wrong ways around. So you have to imagine that it works out that the red ones are, according to the theory, distant. They're, according to the theory, they're very distant and the blue ones, according to the theory, are relatively close. When I say relatively close, I mean that they are within what is called our particle horizon. The red ones are outside our particle horizon. They can be outside because our light cone extends through, I don't know if I can, yes, you see, the light cone extends through into the previous eon. See, the particle horizon is where it hits the surface, but you, since it keeps on going, you, you can actually see signals from which are outside our, our particle horizon, or at least it's because of the, the other ones keep going. Never mind. It's quite, quite all right to see outside a particle horizon. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. <clears throat> so these ones, but you see the point is you, that they're clumped, not just in angular distribution, <clears throat> but they're clumped also in color, which means that they are, according to the theory, actually localized in, in space. So you're looking at, according to the theory, a very, very big super duper cluster. I'm calling it a super duper cluster. It's really bigger than a, an ordinary galactic cluster where you have a great source of black hole collisions. So that's the view. Here you have a relatively closer, within our particle horizon, collection of, um, see, you might be able to see something over here in, in our ordinary observations. I haven't gone into that. Here you might see something indirectly. Uh, possibly, I think the cold spot is somewhere around here, which is, is the sort of thing you might expect, you see, because if this, uh, was pulling matter towards it in the previous year, and maybe there's a lower density or something. I don't know. You could speculate about all these things. Here's a region 
which is somewhat intermediate, probably more or less where our light cone hits uh, just about on the edge there on the, on the particle horizon. But anyway, whatever theory you have for the source of, of these, this observation, what is producing it, you have to explain the clumpiness of the distribution. And that's pretty hard to see unless you have something like something going on um, in an eon prior to ours. I'm not saying it's necessarily that, but I would like to see an explanation for this signal. Now, the other thing I want to say has to do with the Hawking evaporation. Now, here I have a space-time picture again of a black hole evaporating. So here it formulates, uh, here's the horizon. And as the Hawking evaporation takes place, this lasts an awful long time. For the really big ones, you expect something like 10 to the 100 years or Google years. According to Don Page, I think you have even 10 to the 103 years. So there's some of the biggest ones. Maybe you see even bigger ones sometimes. So it takes an awful long time for these things. First of all, for the temperature of the universe to get lower than the temperature of the black hole. And then when it gets lower, then the black hole starts to be the hottest thing around and it starts to evaporate away radiation. It carries away its mass and so it gets more. more. But this is an incredibly slow process. Maybe it takes over the order of 10 to 100 years. Eventually, it will disappear with what I call a pop. It's a very, very small explosion, maybe like a nuclear explosion at the end, a very small release of energy at the end. Uh, and all this other radiation simply goes out into, into the uh, space. Now, what happens to it? Well, here I have a, a diagram. This is a, a, a conformal diagram. I, should, I, I want to make a point here, which people often talk about when they talk about black hole evaporation. They talk about the information paradox. Um, the fact that you seem to lose information and in the singularity, and that seems to be a contradiction. I've never regarded it as a contradiction. Uh, well, first of all, I don't believe it. And here you see in this picture, this is the singularity. You see, it looks time-like the way it's drawn going right up here, but the black cones are all pointing into it. So it's really space-like. So in this conformal diagram, it's really space-like. And if you fall through the black hole, if you had a really big one, you could play lots of games of rummy and all sorts of things. And you could, uh, you could uh, certainly, information in what you're doing, you're playing cards all the time. Why does that information escape outwards? No, it doesn't escape outwards. It simply gets squashed into the singularity. And you might have a lot of time because I imagine it's, I don't know how long you would have, probably a year in order to, before you encounter the singularity. So, so there's lots of time to do what you like there. And if that information is to propagate outside, you have to violate the no cloning theorem about quantum mechanics. It just gets destroyed in a singularity. I could never see anything wrong with that. And one of the reasons I never see anything wrong with it is because unitarity, after all, doesn't hold in our universe. Uni unitarity only holds when you don't have the reduction of the state. Now, if, if you believe, as I do, that the reduction of the state is a gravitational effect, then you're certainly not going to get unitarity when a black hole is around. The black hole will violate unitarity simply because it's a very gravitational situation. And therefore, the whatever it is that's reducing the state in the measurement process is coming in and contributing to the loss of information. So unitarity is, according to this picture, violated. Anyway, that was just an aside, really, because it's not part of the story. It's just that when people talk about retaining information and trying to get it in black holes and straining themselves to an enormous degree to try and to get a time symmetric picture or something here, it seems to me that general relativity is telling you that you do lose information and then you have quantum mechanics has to make up its mind and agree with that. So, so I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Now I'm talking about a paper which just came out recently. Well, the work was done over several years, but um, refined in many ways. Uh, and the paper was published in the monthly, notice, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. 
getting on for a year ago now. I've lost track of how long it was, something like nine months. And it was a paper by Christoph Meisner, um, <clears throat> Daniel Ann, and Pavel Nirovsky, and uh, two Poles, that is, and a Korean who now works in New York, who did all the complicated detail in that. It was a, a, a statistical procedure due to Christoph Meisner. And the idea was to look for what I'm calling hawking points. What is a hawking point? Well, the horizontal line here, this is a space time, is the bo bottom part of the picture is a space time picture. The top part is just indicating the intensity of the signal. Bottom part is a space time picture. So here we have the, this is the crossover surface. This is the remote future of the previous eon, according to the theory. And here is a supermassive black hole, a cluster of galaxies here, supermassive black hole. The radiation of that cluster, that supermassive black hole is almost entirely squashed up into that tiny point. I think it's useful if I can flip backwards to this, to the Escher picture. You see, when you get close to the edge, everything is so squashed up. If this was a space time picture, you can imagine there was a black hole here and all the radiation gets squashed up, even though it's spread out over the huge vast regions of space, that radiation is tiny, tiny, tiny in the squashing up into a little tiny point. So it really is squashed into a tiny little point. It's not to be thought of as spread out because it's not spread out. That's because it happens so late. If you think of 10 to the 100 years or even 10 to the 50 years, that's all squashed up into a tiny little point. So all the energy gets squashed into that point. Now you can, the, the entropy in this thing, well, uh, there's no formula for how what entropy does, no doubt gets squashed into that little point. What about the energy? Well, you, there's a formula you can work out. Uh, you see, you must imagine everywhere else where you're not at this Hawking point, as I'm calling it, H is the Hawking point, everywhere else is smooth, so you can do nice calculations of what happens and you can do integrals around here. And these integrals can measure the amount of energy in this thing. So when you get onto the other side, the integral is there. You can't get rid of it. The energy is there. So that now gets squashed, spread out over, this is now from this to the, well, decoupling D or the uh, last scattering surface or whatever you want to call it. They're all, all very close to the same place. And that is where this, you see 380,000 years, this energy gets spread out and spread out and spread out, and the photons scatter around and scatter and scatter. And this is a sort of Gaussian-like distribution for the intensity. So you get an intensity increasing towards the middle, and that is what we look for. And if we look for signals, basically you look for a ring around this suggested point and to see whether you have this decrease in temperature as you go outwards. And is this significant? In fact, it is significant according to the analysis, Christoph Meisner's analysis and, and Daniel Ann's very detailed working out of the Planck data. And it comes out that there are these points, something like also with a, 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 an intensity of something like 30 times the general temperature variations that you see in the sky. So it's quite large. Um, and you see these signals with a confidence level of 99.98 confidence level. So it's pretty strong confidence level. Maybe there's something else and not this, but you've got to explain them if they're something else. Um, I should also explain that using an another analysis, not quite so with the confidence level of that, but Daniel will look to see where these points are. And I should say that the five strongest points in the Planck data, again, the analysis was done in the WMAP data, and you can see those five strongest points are also points in the WMAP data. They're exactly in the same places in the WMAP data. So although the WMAP analysis is done very differently from Planck analysis, you get those five strongest points in exactly the same places. There's another point in the Planck data, which is just about as strong, sorry, in the WMAP data, and you look for that in the Planck data, and that's also there too. So there are six points, which I say are pretty good candidates as Hawking points. And so I'll leave you with that, and thank you very much for listening to the talk. Okay. 
Thank you very much for your great talk. Questions, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are some questions also in the chat. I think. Yes. Yeah, but if there are some questions, you just raise hands and... Uh... I don't see raised hands. I see only one. Uh-huh. Philip, please. Ah, Norma. Norma Sanchez first. Please ask your questions. Thank yourself. you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Rosha. Here is uh, Norma from Paris. Hello. Uh, Hello, hello, uh, greet, uh, uh, gr greet and con 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 congratulations for your uh, clear talk. Thank now you. I would like, uh, I mean, adopting, uh, adopting your framework, I would like uh, to know, you have two uh, possibilities set or two proposals for testing uh, this um, um, cyclic, and uh, conformal geometry, as you explain in eons and so on. So one is this uh, concentric rings, and the other, uh, the six, six eights, or perhaps more uh, candidates for the Hawking points, both in the CMB data. Yes. And my question is, uh, how to, uh, how to um, uh, say uh, no that uh, you have uh, an infinite uh, cycle um, of uh, uh, e eons set of all these states, co asymptotically conformal states. How do you know that you have an infinite number or you have uh, a very high set but a finite number of, of all these cycles? This is uh, one, one question. Um, uh, and the, if you have a way to see that also in, 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 in the real, I mean, if you have, if I said, uh, I, I think in terms of uh, Stephen Hawking multiverse, and you have more than, I mean, a collection of what you are explaining here, uh, what could be, I mean, what could be your views on that? Thank you. I, thank you for the question. I mean, there are, of course, a lot of speculation here. I we only directly see, according to the proposal, the evidence is only concerning the immediately preceding eon, and you can raise many questions whether only two eons. <laughs> it's only a, a simplest hypothesis to say there's an infinite sequence. I have no reason to believe. There might be 17, or there might be 953, or there might be an infinite number. They might evolve. You see, certainly John Wheeler explored the idea of the constants of nature changing. He imagined not this picture, of course, but it was the, the more like the Friedman closed model where you have an expanding model and it collapses and it, and it bounces like this. Now, uh, then he imagined that you could have the constants of nature changing from one to the next and perhaps evolving from some initial value. Now, the only thing I have to say on the observational side, it's only pure preference to say, well, the simplest model is to say they go on forever because then I would have to say what happened at the beginning and there's another, it doesn't get around the problem of, of the beginning anymore. So I would like to say they go on forever. But that's not confirmed in observation. I have no idea how you would confirm that with observation. But I would say one thing, which is that there is a small amount of evidence that the previous eon was not enormously different from ours. Because the there's a well, nice calculation due to Paul Todd and some other people, um, Penn State, was it, I think, who, who worked out basically. If you think of the people in the next eon, how big would the rings get? You see, you have to imagine black holes colliding. You have to have enough time in the eon for black holes to get big enough so that they would galaxy in galaxies and so the galaxies would collide and then they would 
send these large gravitational wave signals. And that would be roughly now, you see. So when I say now, I mean, uh, well, it's about in the picture, you, you can see the conformal picture and you squash down infinity and you stretch out the Big Bang. And imagine that is the whole eon from Big Bang to remote future. We're about three quarters of the way up, something like that. And so if the black hole formulation was round about, I mean, the black hole collisions, supermassive black hole collisions were round about then, then there would be a maximum size, you could see these rings. That maximum size is about 40 degrees across the sky. Now you look at Vahe's pictures and see how big they are. You can see there are some about 30 degrees. There's some pretty big ones. Maybe getting up to, well, 40 degrees to see the biggest possible might be a bit of a stretch of the imagination. Seeing 30, I think is about right. So it seems to me that there is no evidence, at least at this scale, for a huge change in the scales from one eon to the next. I would go on the theory that there isn't a big change. And this also leads to other possible experimental tests. There was a question raised by Jim Peebles with me uh, a few weeks ago, where you look for parameters, you see, there should be a connection between the parameters in the early universe with the parameters in the late universe. And we know from observations something about each. And can we see when, how they cross over as you get from one side to the other? Do they agree? Does this tell you that the previous eon was rather like ours? So in your answer to your question, I would say very little flimsy evidence, not very much at the moment, but there's a flimsy little bit of evidence that the previous eon was something like ours and perhaps no enormous indication that there has to be a large evolution from eon to eon, giving a great, maybe a big early one and three or four and that's us. <laughs> it, it's a, a bias, if you like, in my view, that, that they should remain more or less the same, but that's the simplest hypothesis for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We could discuss after. Thank you. Answer your question, yes. Okay. Now the questions from uh, Philip Mannheim. Yes. Please. Yes. Hello, Roger. Hello. Uh, hello again. Um, I've been, I thought a little bit about this question about the vial tensor starts off at zero and later on becomes non-zero. And that's because the standard picture is you start off with a very symmetric universe and evolve into a less symmetric one. So I asked the question, could it be the other way around? Uh, could you start out with an early universe with a viscosity and have a late time solution that was, that was Robertson Walker? And I found an exact solution to the Einstein equations where the viscosity switched off at late times. It was work done with my one-time student, Yao Bing Deng. Um, so at least in principle, it could be that symmetry improves with time rather than necessarily um, gets worse with time. But what are you doing with the entropy in this picture? Is the entropy coming down? Well, uh, you finish up with Maxwell Boltzmann. I see, so it's, so, so it's basically a, a um, I mean, like if you time reverse, I mean, it's a time reverse. It, it could be your earlier eon. You see, what I was thinking of was what's always impressed me about the Boltzmann equation is that the solution at late times is independent of the interactions, provided there are interactions to get you there. And so maybe when we just think of, oh, well, today or the black body is, is uh, Bose Einstein, maybe it didn't start out that way. And that was, so at least I wanted to see, could you actually find an exact solution that would do so? Not necessarily that that's the way the world works. I think, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to find solutions and I certainly agree with that. But on the other hand, it doesn't address the second law problem. I mean, are you having a model in which second law goes the other way? And I think yeah. lots of people try, I mean, I know um, Ave Astakar with his loop variable things, for example, and other people, I'm not, 
concentrating on that particularly, where you imagine something like a bounce. So that uh, you get through the Big Bang and if you work through on the other side, your time, your expression, I guess feelings of which time went would be in the opposite direction. So the entropy, I guess, would increase away from the a crossover from one year onto the next. But I find this a very unsatisfying picture because somehow you, you simply have to postulate this very, very special initial crossover situation. And it doesn't come from anywhere. Whereas you see the picture I'm presenting, you see, I didn't really talk too much about where the entropy goes, but it's a question too, is the entropy goes into the black holes and then you have to worry about loss of information or not. It doesn't make much difference really, because it all gets concentrated in the Hawking points. And the Hawking points basically destroy those degrees of freedom because they're on the other side, you're looking at effects which are smaller than the Planck distance. So you have no control over what happens to them. So the picture I have is that that's how the second law is made sense of in this picture is that all the entropy gets squashed into the Hawking points pretty well. I mean, not complete, totally all of it, but almost all of it. And then it just gets wiped out. And you start over again with a very tiny entropy. I mean, you'd need equations to tell you what happens to, to Hawking points. Well, I just give up in despair and say, well, <laughs> they're genuinely our singularity. And the singularity swallows all the degrees of freedom that are hanging around there. But yes, I mean, you can think of models which go the other way. But I think the problem is if you're going to fit them in with the universe that we, we know about, you're tied in with the second law of thermodynamics. And if you're postulating this for an eon of a sort, which goes the other way around, then you have this problem of the join being quite unlike the mm -hmm. similarities you get in the future. And it's not answering the question. It's not saying singularities in space-time have to be like that because they don't. Certainly generic singularities are those which you get in, in black holes. But whereas the picture I put forward, I mean, isn't the full answer because you need to have equations to make sense of all sorts of things. But uh, it gives you a picture in which the second law issue is in a sense resolved. It tells you it's resolved in the way which we see. That is to say that the entropy is low in the gravitational degrees of freedom. That's to say it's uniform. And that uniformity comes because the close to the sitter space is very uniform. And the matter distribution is, is very, not totally uniform as you seem to see in the clustering of the super duper clusters and all that, but pretty uniform. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to explore other, other, other models as you're doing, yeah, sure, but how do they fit? I was, I was just exploring a, mod, a, a point of principle. Sure, no, no, that's fine, yeah. No, no, interesting, yeah. Okay. No, there is a question from Igor Valovich, please. Ask uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. I have a question, maybe it's partially related with the previous one. One of your arguments that uh, quantum gravity cannot resolve the singularity problem is that quantum gravity is time symmetric, but in the universe there is an increasing of entropy. But the same argument you can say about the ordinary condensed matter statistical physics. Also, we have time reversible Hamiltonian at the micro level, and then still there is increasing of entropy. Yes. Um, the standard answer, you know, of course, is we consider the coarse grained quantities. Why don't you use the same logic for quantum gravity? Why don't I say, I wasn't quite sure I understood the question here, that quantum gravity is like a Boltzmann? No, quantum gravity like the Schrodinger equation. Um, it's like a what? So it's time reversible, but time then we have to take the coarse-grained 
procedure what? that we obtain the increasing group entropy? Yes, well, you, you have to, well, <laughs> I mean, sure, you can ignore the details. I mean, of course, that's what you do when you look at entropy. You say, well, I, I don't care about the details that I, I'm just looking at parameters which characterize the general situation. And then, um, yes. This is a standard approach in statistical physics. Yeah. You have ergodicity, we believe that there is ergodicity. But you Therefore, still, don't, I don't quite see how that resolves the issue of the, I mean, statistical physics, you're saying you're not looking at the details, you're saying you're looking at averages. Yes. You're looking at general average. Or, or, uh, but here, you can say that for the remote future and for the Big Bang, because there's not much going on. I mean, in the Big Bang, you've got a situation and you've got averages there. But the gravitational degrees of freedom are not activated. I mean, if they were, then you would, you would get a situation which would look like a big crunch. And the big crunch is where the gravitational degrees of freedom are activated, and you get the vile curvature singularity. It's not nothing like the Big Bang we see with with, with um, no vile curvature, basically. And they, I, I'm not quite sure I understand um, how just saying statistical physics gets you out of the problem. I mean, the, the approach is the following: sorry? we cannot measure absolutely precisely our uh, processes, our physical phenomena. Therefore, we have to take some coarse graining. But it leads to increasing yes, yes. Well, you can take coarse graining here, if you like. Yes. Um, and that would, you still have the feature that the coarse graining, I mean, if you had gravitational degrees of freedom in the Big Bang, which were making it look anything like what we expect in a big crunch, they would completely dominate the situation. And it's not like what we see. You have to say that the gravitational degrees of freedom are not activated. I don't quite see how coarse graining comes into it. It makes no difference. I mean, uh, the initial state, I mean, the irregularities such as the Hawking points, but if you look at the uh, general situation away from the Hawking points, you have something which is very uniform. And yeah, you could you could use an analysis, you can coarse grain, you can do what you like. But it doesn't get you out of the fact that the gravitational degrees of freedom are not activated. Okay, thank you. Let me ask you another question. You okay. mentioned that the gravitational field could help to understand the reduction of the wave function. Yes. Would you comment about this? Because different <laughs> scales, it seems. Well, it's really another, another talk, which, which I could have given another talk. Yeah, um, I mean, something I thought for a long time. And I guess the argument which I regard as most persuasive in a way is to look for, consider an experiment on the tabletop where you want to take the Earth's gravitation. It's a quantum experiment. And you want to take the Earth's gravitational field into consideration. Now, what I'm trying to point out is that there is a conflict between the principle of equivalence, which is the fundamental basis of Einstein's theory, general relativity, and the principle of superposition, which is a basis of quantum mechanics, or one of the bases of quantum mechanics. So you can say you have a, a superposition principle. Now, if you look at this experiment on a tabletop, where you want to take into consideration the Earth's gravitational field, now, there are two ways you could do this. One would be the normal way that people in quantum mechanics would do. You put a term in the Hamiltonian to account for the Earth's gravitational field, and you just chug away, use ordinary quantum mechanics. The other way would be to take Einstein seriously and say, no, you should say that you take coordinates which are freely falling. And in this free fall system, there is no gravitational field. You can just cancel it out by free fall. And then you calculate away and you get almost the same answer. 
you get a wave function which is almost exactly the same as the other one, one of them where there is no term in the Hamiltonian for the gravitational field, and the other where you simply use a freely falling frame. And you translate back, and you find that the wave function in each case is the same, except for a phase factor. So you might say, who cares? Phase factor, uh, you're only going to square moduli, and so you don't worry about that. But you look carefully at the phase factor, and you see it involves the exponential of a term which involves the accelerations and squared and the time cubed. There's an exponential of a time cubed term. So then you say, well, that's a different, if you want to compare those two, they're two different vacua. So the Newtonian perspective, that's the first one where you put the term in the Hamiltonian, and the Einsteinian perception, perspective, that's the second one, where you look at the free fall. And the difference between the two is that they're actually in different vacua, the different quantum field vacua, because of the Fourier decomposition would be different because of the T cubed term. Again, you could say, who cares? Stick to your vacuum and it doesn't make any difference. Now I change the problem a little bit. I say in this situation on the tabletop, I have a massive body. And this massive body is put into a superposition of two different locations in the quantum system. So it's, it's, I, I should be allowed to do that in my quantum system. But then I have a problem because if I use the Einsteinian perspective, the vacuum keeps changing as I move around in different places, I find it's a different, different vacuum. And so it's not, you, you can't do it consistently. So the idea is what you do. Well, what I say is you say, okay, you, you cheat a little bit, excuse me. You say, all you do is to regard the different vacuum as giving you an error, an uncertainty in your measure. And it's a reasonable thing to do. And you integrate this over the whole of the space and you find it comes out as, a, as a, an energy uncertainty. And this energy uncertainty for a superposition of two masses, you say is, like with Planck's, with um, Heisenberg's time energy uncertainty, a mass energy uncertainty is like a time. I mean, it's inversely related to a time uncertainty. This time, as I regard it as like an unstable particle where it has a lifetime, and that lifetime is inversely related to the energy uncertainty. So this gives you a lifetime for the system. And so this gives you a measure of how long that superposition will last before it becomes one or the other. It turns out to be a, just exactly the same as a form, a measure come out, came out earlier for, by Laios Diyoshi. I mean, he had a quite, did completely different theory, but it came out with the same uh, lifetime. But the idea was that this is a motivation coming from gravitational principles, basically principle of equivalence, which tells you that a superposition between massive objects will have a lifetime which you can calculate from this formula. Anyway, I'm sorry, it's a long, rather a long-winded answer to the question. So that if you try to take the principle of equivalence and combine it with the principle of um, superposition in quantum mechanics, there is a tension between these two. And that tension is resolved by saying that there is a lifetime for superposed systems where the gravitational field has become significant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too small to have been measured yet, but not too small to be measured in proposed experiments. The main experiment was the person who was doing this was Dirk Baumister, who has for many years been trying to perform an experiment which would test to see whether this proposal for the reduction time is correct or not. Uh, he's fairly close to the, the stage at which you could make a decision on this, but not yet. Well, thank you very much for the second talk. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Hawaii Roy. Please ask your question, Roy. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, uh, sir. Thanks for the wonderful talk. 
so my question was that uh, in the ccc how would an observer uh, characterize different eons so suppose if if a massless observer has traversed from one eon into into the next eon so how will he how will he distinguish between the two eons how will he know that he has crossed from one into the other will it be by measuring some physical observable or uh, or will some uh, will some change in some other constant govern it so how would he distinguish between the two well in my view i mean as i said i touched upon the issue of possibly constants changing but in my view it would just be detailed differences um it would be pretty hard to get across, I should say, but not totally inconceivable. You'd have to have some being who would be made out of mass and material and, and preserve um, its being, its conscious perceptions from one eon to the next. Maybe not impossible. Um, but you see, the distribution of matter would not be the same, that's all. I'm not trying to say that there is a, an overall clock. You see, if constants of nature evolved, which is possible, you could say that the fine structure constant had a value what it has now in our eon, and then the next eon would have a slightly different value, and that would label it the eons, and so they would be labeled in some way. I would rather like to think that it's not labeled in such a way, that the labeling of the eons is distinct, is just that their mass distribution is different. It's like with space, you see, why, why am I here rather than in in India, I'm here because the well, the surroundings, I look out the window and I see different things from if I would if I was in India. So it's different places. And so the eons would have detailed differences, but overall, they would not be um, major differences between them. That's the picture I hold. It's not necessarily the case. You could still have a CC mo CCC model in which the constants of nature did evolve from eon to eon. And so in the sense I think you're addressing that maybe there would be a labeling of the eons, which would be say, okay, when the constants of nature have these values, then that's this eon. When they have those values, that's that eon. Maybe, but I'm not trying to say that. Um, I think I would feel more comfortable with eons where the numbers are the same in each eon. And the difference would only be in how the mass distributions would differ from each other, which of course is a big difference, but the very detailed one and not an overall one. But I have no reason in the mathematics, apart from an emotional one, <laughs> to say that I think I believe these numbers should remain the same, except for this very rough one, which I described earlier, which seemed to indicate that the sizes of the rings that you get by Vahe's analysis is consistent with the black hole collisions coming at a sort of time as they do in our eon. So maybe no big changes from eon to eon, but that's not much of a signal. Okay. Thank you, sir. My next question is from George Savidian. Georgi, please. Uh, hello, thank you for a wonderful talk. I would like to ask you about the, uh, your comments about Halatnikov Lifshitz's work. You say that in case of black hole, if the uh, collapse is asymmetric, nevertheless, the singularity appear because of the trap surface. But in case of big crunch, there is this uh, chaotic uh, um, yes. uh, evolution. So. And sometimes you say that it was wrong uh, with the with the black hole, but you accept that in case of big crunch, it is correct. Or what is your comment? Thank you. Oh, it could be correct. You see, I I never studied this work in any great detail, but um, I think well, of course, there was a mistake in the earlier work, which was they corrected. Well, that was with Belinsky, and the work with Belinsky certainly corrected that error, and they have these. But Bianchi 9 models, which were very similar. I mean, Charlie Misner, Charles Misner, had a different approach, and they come to very similar conclusions about the way that the, you've got these different, different three directions in which the curvatures 
sort of transfer from each one to make. Yes, yes, there are different scales for every. Yes, that's right. You have a different one taking over. A very complicated behavior, very beautiful and interesting behavior. Quite possibly the sort of thing you might get in a generic case. I don't know any anal. I haven't followed up any recent work on this to know how generic that is. I would rather like it to be because I, I think it's very beautiful, the analysis that comes about there. But it's very different from what one sees in the Big Bang, because in the, the case that you, you get vial curvature, which diverges wildly in these models, in the Bianchi 9 models, say, and I think in pretty well all of them, you, I, not that I've looked at them for a long time, but you, you expect to get vial curvature, which diverges. And so quite unlike the situation in the Big Bang. See, in the Big Bang, you have which you might say matter dominated in the sense that the curvature that goes infinite is in the mass, in the matter distribution. It's a dark matter, I suppose, largely. So you have dark matter, which, which uh, gives you a, a pretty uniform initial distribution. Um, and the vial curvature seems to be pretty close to zero, uh, which is not the kind of thing you would expect to see in a generic singularity in a black hole. Of course, one doesn't have rigorous theorems, as far as I'm aware, telling you what the generic situation is in, in the collapse. But the indications seem to be that you get wildly, wildly diverging vial curvature. Thank you very much. OK. The next question. Norma, do you want uh, to ask more questions? If yes, please ask. Thank you very much. I don't know if I am allowed to ask a, a second question. I mean, oh, I you please want... ask, yes. Thank please. you. Thank, yes. Uh, thank again. Um, Roger, I, um, uh, yes, I found very interesting, I mean, uh, uh, your proposal and would like to know if I, I am think, if I think in terms of, um, uh, small black holes, or say the, the last stage when uh, really we have a small uh, black hole for uh, Stephen evaporation, uh, which is the place of that in this framework? Because as I understand, I mean, you have this, the supermassive black holes uh, will be, I mean, because they are uh, precisely supermassive, Yes. They will live till uh, till all the age of the universe, and then go again uh, to the eon, and and then produce uh, these uh, these um, uh, rings, or uh, I mean, or uh, yes, these um, um, uh, prints in the CMB or others, perhaps. Uh, I am wondering uh, which is the room for. Uh, Planck scale physics is just in the transition uh, of of the one eon to another, or in the if you are, if you have room for the smallest black holes here, uh, that is uh, that is one point I would because also uh, in this transition I mean we are say I I believe. We are in an eon. We came from a from a previous one. Our universe today is in the maximum entropy, gravitational entropy. Then, if we go to another transition, that makes two uh, from mini from maximum to minimum in some sense. Uh, so you need some dual transformation here for for that. I mean. Uh, in your conformal geometry uh, uh, picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Well, let me let me reformulate what I was trying to say before. You see, as you say, the entropy goes up, and you get the maximum entropy in the black holes, and then they radiate, and you get certain amount of entropy in the radiation, and certain amount getting destroyed in the singularity. Now, it doesn't make too much difference in this picture 
because the radiation is concentrated, because it happens so late in the crossover, it becomes concentrated into the little point. And so that is where, uh, I mean, if you talk about mini black, I, sh I think your question is more related to something else I should say here, which is when you look at the cross the equations for the crossover, what you find is what, in detail, what you have to do is to introduce, you have a metric for the pre crossover and the metric for the post crossover and an additional metric, which I call the bandage metric, which covers both. Now there is a conformal factor which goes from the remote future to the bandage metric. And then another formal factor, conformal factor, which goes from the bandage to the big bang metric, the next one. And when things are getting out of hand, you do the calculations in the bandage metric, which remains finite. Now you have a conformal factor which converts to its inverse. This is one of the rules. I see. And you I have see. a big omega on one side and a little omega on the other side, which is the inverse of the other. Now, when you try to talk about the, so the way to do the calculations in the very early universe in the other side, you might say, who knows what goes on in transplankian physics? So there's a trick here which you can use which Christoph Meisner and I worked at. I uh, we haven't really written it up, so it needs to be developed more, but let me tell you what happens. You could use the pre-Big Bang metric, the, the bandage ca carries you over from one side to the other smoothly, but then you can go back to the pre-Big Bang um, metric, and you have now a picture of a collapsing universe. And you can evolve that according to conventional equations. Now, this collapsing universe, however, is strange in that the gravitational constant, the effective gravitational constant has become negative. Nice. And so long as the matter is all very widely distributed, it doesn't make any difference. But once the gravitation starts to become important, then you get into a bit of trouble. So what Christoph does is he goes over to the post Big Bang metric at that stage. And he finds by calculation that he can get over by avoiding all the transplankian stuff by looking at the collapsing model universe uh, metric and then nip over to the metric. You'll just get over the, the constants work so that you can, you can have a, you can avoid the transplankian stage and you can talk about uh, particle physics. I mean, he understands about particle physics. I don't. <laughs> but he, I he argued with me that, that, that you, could, you could do the calculations. I will have to talk to him about it again, because we don't have a written paper on this, but it addresses, it tries to address the, pa the question you raised, which is an important oh. one. How do you Thank deal you. with the transplankian physics? Yes. On the and the argument is that you can do it in CCC, by taking the physics, well, it's really like looking at the bandage metric, but in order to treat the bandage metric on that side, you, you have to look at what happens on the, on the collapsing model picture. Mm. It needs more looking at, but at least it does seem to provide a procedure which seems to make sense without getting, getting into trouble with plants, planky and plant ideas and mini black holes and all that. And, yeah. and you don't want them because they, who knows what they, what they do. <laughs> yeah. That's good news. Uh, I, I look forward for, for, the, for the paper set, uh, I mean, for your next paper. I, 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 am looking, I am looking the problem from another perspective, but I, I want to, uh, I definitively, I want to, to do in, uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. Um, I mean, in the crossover, as, a, as, as you explain it now, I, 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 I see the points. I, I, I see the way, the procedure. Thank well, you very much. My pleasure. Well, thanks for the question. That's an important question, and I certainly thank you. Okay. The next question, we have a question from Emilio Elizabeth. He cannot raise the hand, but Emilio, are you here? Yes. Please uh, ask your question. Uh, okay, uh, my question is, do your 
famous theorem have any role in this new picture? <laughs> and have you thought about any replacement in a way of those theorems here? Well, of course, it was the theorems which led me into this area. But it was, you see, I had my whole theorem to do with black holes. And I gave a lecture of, about that in King's College London in, I think it was 1964. And then uh, Stephen Hawking was not there, despite what the movie says. <laughs> but he was in Cambridge and Dennis Sharma asked me to give a repeat talk in Cambridge. So I talked in Cambridge and Stephen was there. And then we had private conversation with George Ellis and we Stephen picked up on the techniques that I was using and applied them to the Big Bang. So the, his, his focus was in trying to apply the techniques that I had originated, but which he then developed, so they could be applied more appropriately in, in situations where you have cos cosmological situation. And then eventually we got together. He had three papers in the Royal Society, which were very important and influential using the developed techniques that he had used. And then we got together later. So that we certainly developed the techniques to be used in cosmology too. But the thing that worried me there, I remember for a long time thinking, why didn't people look at all these more complicated cosmologies that you could have? And I remember this conversation I had with Jim Peebles. I think I was in Princeton at the time. I can't remember exactly when it was. And I was kept puzzling about why cosmologists didn't look at these other models. And I, uh, Jim Peebles was in a car going to the Stevens Institute conference where I was going in a separate car. And I just saw him and I asked him the question. I said, why don't you cosmologists look at all these other interesting, complicated types of singularities and just concentrate on one case. Why don't you look at all of these others? And he looked at me and said, because the universe is not like that. And I thought, my gosh, the universe is not like that. And this sort of sent me, sent me thinking, why is it that the universe has this, well, low, very low contribution from the gravitational degrees of freedom. And the gravitational degrees of freedom are in the vial curvature, and why are they not activated? So it was just that way of thinking. It came from the singularity theorems. So when oh, you yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. singularity theorems, which started me on this line of thought, but it was a long, tortuous line of thought, which really came away from the singularity theorems. They applied, but for some reason, they didn't tell you very much because the singularity was this very special situation, like all the cosmological models which people were talking about, which simply ignored things like singularity theorems because they were assuming all this symmetry. Hmm. And the universe, remarkably, was very like that. But then the later things which I was talking about too, too is that it's not exactly like that. You seem to see these rather very large regions where there may be super duper clusters in the previous eon and presumably in our eon, if we can look at them carefully enough, and uh, hawking points which deviate from exact symmetry. Mm -hmm. So we have to study these deviations from exact symmetry. The singularity theorems were well, the one I had initially applied when you have non-negative energies. And so that was the only thing you really need to assume that the energy flux across light, light waves was never negative. And they were forced into the singular situations. It didn't tell you anything about what the singularities looked like. And so certainly the work by the Russians on the, um, and also by Charles Misner on looking at these uh, more complicated situations probably gives us a better picture of what happens. Nothing like the uh, of an Abbott Snyder model, which assumes an awful lot of symmetry, are very, very complicated. Um, nothing like what we see in the Big Bang. So, very curious. <laughs> the singularity theorems don't take us very far there. They just tell you what the singularity is. They don't tell you what they're like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Thank you. Okay. 
The next question is from Pavel Petrov. Pavel, are you ready? To yes, I am. This? Thank you very much for a nice talk. I have actually I have several questions. The first one is about do you have any criteria about when gravity causes the reduction of wave function? Maybe the mass distribution or something else. Mm -hmm. Other question is that we know if we have a gravity, it causes a collapse, the wave function reduction. Maybe it can cause the causality violation. So how can we resolve that problem? And maybe there are some non-local large scale effects due to that new mechanism that connect gravity and quantum mechanics. What was the violation you mentioned in the end? Casualty. You, you have, uh, we have past and future, and we can disturb the connection between past and future, between the events. The, we can know the, about the future when we're in the past. I mean that casualty relation. That sort of thing, yes. <laughs> okay, sorry for my, sorry for my accent. Yeah. I mean, there are all sorts of questions you're raising here, which are deep questions, which I think about in my funny way. And certainly, I, I have thought for a long time that the reduction of the stage or the collapse of the wave function is a gravitational effect. I didn't have the argument which I sketched out shortly in, in an earlier question for a long I had a different argument, but I think the more powerful one was the one I gave there. Um, I have thought again more recently at these questions because of the lockdown, really. I was supposed to be traveling around the world and going to Moscow, amongst other places, and, and I was just not able to go to anywhere. The first one I had to cancel was Moscow, unfortunately. That was, uh, I was almost going, and, and it just became unsafe from the point of view of medical people here. Um, but on the other hand, it enabled me to think about questions which I hadn't thought through so much before. And mainly the questions were to do with the collapse of the wave function. So I've certainly developed my ideas a lot more than I had previously. And um, I hope, I want to write, I wrote some notes which I sent out to many colleagues that ended up only about 30 people or so. And I had a fair amount of input back from them. And it developed my ideas quite a bit. I realized I had to rewrite the notes. I haven't rewritten them. Maybe that will be a long article or even maybe a book. Um, because there are very curious features that the collapse of the wave function has to have, partly to do, well, you need to have two concepts of reality which are not quite the same. One of them is what I call classical reality, and that is more or less described by Einstein's general theory of relativity, and the other is quantum reality. And the collapse of the wave function gives you an input into the classical reality from the quantum reality. It behaves very curiously with regard to the progression of time which is one of the major things which I had to develop in this scheme. And it also has to do with other things which I was playing around with a, for a long time to do with the relationship with consciousness. You see, there was in the early, the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, several of them, including particularly Wigner and von Neumann, used to think that the wave function collapse was to do with a conscious observer. So the collapse of the wave function was when conscious being looked at the system in some sense. I never really believed that. My view is almost the opposite. It's no, that this process of the collapse of the wave function is a physical process, but that physical process is the basis of what's going on in our heads, which creates conscious perceptions. And playing around with certain things going way back to when I wrote The Emperor's New Mind, for instance, I was trying to explore this and I described some experiments due to Benjamin Libet in the 1970s, which indicates some very curious relation to the perception of time and uh, the, well, how the timing works in, in conscious perception. And I think the kind of view which I'm putting for now maybe explains those curious experiments that Libet has. I won't go into it now because it's hard to explain, also not developed properly. But all I'm trying to indicate is that these things are important questions. I think consciousness is deeply related to the collapse of the wave function, but not in the way that people originally seem to think, namely that it collapses the wave function. No, 
the wave function collapses because of physics. And it's a physics, this is my view, because of physics, which has to do with trying to bring quantum mechanics and general relativity together. So it's not a quantum theory of gravity in technical sense as being a quantum theory. You don't quantize gravity, you gravitize quantum mechanics, or rather you do both in some kind of curious mixture. So what you do by gravitizing quantum mechanics, you have to make um, the quantum theory evolve in a way in which the wave function collapses in an objective sense of the word. But it does lead to curious almost paradoxes. And these almost paradoxes have to be resolved. And there is something which I am still, I'm working on much more than I used to. And I concentrated this on lockdown, but there's very little, apart from the notes which I was writing and they need rewriting, I should say, um, which, which were the, it was the problem was the Nobel Prize because I was writing these notes. And then when the Nobel Prize came along, I got too, too many distractions and I got stuck on writing the notes. So they got rather stuck, but I have to, I have to go back to it. It's a, it's a rather confused answer to your question, but I hope it's helpful. Okay, thanks a lot for well, an answer. Hello. Okay, when my next question we have from Sravan Kumar, please. Uh, hi, hi, Rosa. So my question is about predictions. So usually the key prediction of any early universe physics is gravitational, primordial gravitational waves. So from CCC, what is the prediction you have uh, with this? Maybe it's, the, it's good to distinguish with the inflationary gravitational waves, perhaps. Yeah. It's an interesting question. And certainly Pavel Nurovsky has been looking at this issue recently. Um, they can certainly get through. And the signals which I was talking about for the rings, um, in those you're not directly looking at the gravitational waves, you're only looking at the effects that the gravitational wave would have on the matter distribution. Maybe with some appropriate kind of detector, you could see gravitational waves from the previous eon directly as gravitational waves. I don't know. I haven't looked at that very carefully. That's certainly something to be looked at. Whether they would be strong enough to see is a very interesting question. There is a related question which has to do with the dark matter. You see, according to the crossover from one eon to the next, there has to be, for the consistency of the equations, a new material created, which is a scalar material, which I consider to be the primordial form of dark matter. Now, you, since the dark matter is created in the crossover, and the equations really insist on that, you need it. Otherwise, you have inconsistent equations. So this, what I would call dark matter, I call it the particles of this dark matter I call eribons, because I tried to find an, an ancient Greek god who was the earliest god, you see, and I was told that there, that there was this fellow Erebos, who was the son of chaos, and he was therefore the first. He wasn't actually a god because the gods were too late. <laughs> he was a pre-god. And I thought he was a good um, person to have as, as the name of the particles. So I call them Eribons. So the particles, the dark matter particles would be Eribons. Now the mass of these particles it's not quite clear, but I think they're, since they're mainly gravitational entities, they should probably be Planck mass particles. Now these Planck mass particles, this is not, not a, a prediction, it's a guess, but I'm saying they're Planck mass particles. They have to decay with a lifetime of something like 10 to the 11 years. The reason for the 10 to the 11 years is to make sense. See, as they decay, you see, I did mention slightly offhandedly, offhandedly the variations in the cosmic microwave background. Where do they come from? If I don't have a inflationary phase, they have to come from a previous eon. So what in the previous eon causes these fluctuations in the temperature? Well, according to what I'm saying, is they come from the decay of the Eribon particles. 
the dark matter particles. Now the decay would be fairly uniform until they start getting thinned out. When they get thin, well, as long as it's uniform, you will get a scale invariant spectrum in the next eon. So that our eon, we're looking at the decay of the Eribons in the previous eon. Now, when they start to thin out, that would be after the half-life. This would be something like 10 to the 11 years. So, so they would start, to, the lifetime would be something like 10 to the 11 years, and then they would start to thin out a bit. And this would be an explanation for the, for the um, uh, what's it called, the spectral index. There is a slight deviation from scale invariance, and that slight deviation from scale invariance would come from the spectral index. I mean, the spectral index is the, is the deviation, and that would come from the from the half life of the area bonds. The theory has not been worked out in in sufficient detail, because one would need to know what the decay mode of these area bonds is, and I those could perhaps be detected. But you see, they since there would be gravitational wave signals, they could maybe be the ones in our eon could be detected by gravitational wave detectors. So that would be something, and now I'm not talking about crossing from one eon to the next, I'm crossing, I'm talking about the decay, early decays of the area bonds in our eon, and there will be lots of them. So although 10 to the 11 years we haven't had yet, <laughs> the large numbers of them would already be decaying because they're the major part of matter in the universe. So you would certainly see their decays if you have the right sensor. Would they be seen in current gravitational wave detectors? I don't know, because I haven't a good theory of the decay of these particles. But I suspect they would decay into gravitational waves and that some kind of gravitational wave detector should be able to see them. Whether they are the current detectors, whether they are other kinds of detectors which are possible. I don't know. So it's a good open, completely open question. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm asking. Thank you. A, a big question. <laughs> we left just yeah. two questions. Okay. Um, the next question is from Bruna Andre Rucha, please, Bruna. Well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, just a small clarification question, but I'm really struggling to understand why the Hawking points are points. Because surely you have to wait a very long time until a super black, black hole pops, but it's still a, a finite amount of proper time. And this boundary that we, that we are matching together is at, in, at no infinity. So why is, just a, why is this just a point? I don't quite get it. Thank you. It's very close to a point. I mean, let me let me just show you here. See here, here's the crossover. Can you see my hands? Yes, I can see them. A black hole. There's its history. Now there's the evaporation coming from the black hole. Now that region within the past future cone of that black hole is insignificant until the black hole evaporates. Now that whole black hole evaporates only when that point is very, very close to crossover. You see, because, I mean, okay, if this is Big Bang, this is um, remote future. Here's us, three quarters of the way up. Here is black hole starting to evaporate. This teeny weeny way underneath that surface. The, the huge black holes that you might see evaporation they're giving you the Hawking points is a very, very tiny point. See, because all that radiation is concentrated in the point. I mean, have a look at the Escher picture, you see, and you see these fish get very small and the radiation is constrained to be within the light cone. Now, when the source of that light cone is very, very late in the evolution, it's just underneath the crossover surface. I see. But what fixes that we are about three quarters of the way until the cross point? Huh? This is just looking at the evolution. I, I can't. This was a calculation done by Paul Todd and some others. I think it was in Penn State. 
I would have to check with Paul exactly who did this, but he did it independently anyway. And he was just looking at the parameters for the universe. And you can see, you know, how long is the evolution, I mean, where you just follow that evolution, which I, I showed you, that, that form of it. And, and you do your conformal transformations and you just see where it comes. You can work it out. Now, this is just using known parameters. And, and this uh, conformal picture is, a, is fairly rigid. That is to say, uh, if you draw the light cones at 45 degrees, that's the, so you can, you can say conformal time is drawing the light cones at 45 degrees. That's what it means. So you simply draw the light cones at 45 degrees and the time is not proper time. There's a formula for it, you see, and there's a square root or something at the beginning. And then when you get to the end, there's an exponential. So, but it's a clearly defined function, which tells you how proper time is mapped onto this conformal diagram. And then you can see where do the light cones come? And you see when you go up, they just con converge on the future space-like surface. Maybe it's important to realize that infinity is space-like, so that the early work on null infinity is relevant, but not the correct answer, because that's looking at an asymptotically flat space-time. In asymptotically flat space-time, infinity, that's null infinity, whereas in the cosmological constant, positive cosmological constant case, you're looking at these cosmological models and the space time future is space-like. And so the light cones simply cut out a finite amount in the picture. And as you go up further and further and further, it's just a small and small region concentrates on a point. So very, very late is almost tucked up against that crossover surface. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Okay, let's go. Oh, still more questions. Um, my question from Oleg Tiryaev. Oleg, please. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for your talk. And I have a question concerning the possible relation of uh, quantum measurement and time error appearance. It's actually based on the short note in the fifth volume of Landau and Lifshitz. Uh, uh, textbook, and it is said that uh, maybe because the second uh, quantum measurement uh, definitely provides uh, the same result as uh, the first one, so it defines the uh, direction of time. And my question is, is there your relation between quantum measurement and gravity uh, can help in uh, establishing such a connection? Well, that's a good question. Um... I don't know. I, mean, I don't know whether the theory where we involve collapse of the wave function becoming a, a part of the combination of quantum, quantum mechanics and gravitational theory, gravitizing quantum mechanics, well, the combination of the two theories where each has to be changed in some way, whether that is going to be time symmetric or not. You see, when you, I mean, certainly when we do measurements, there's a huge time asymmetry and certainly, uh, I mean, people try to make it time asymmetric, like people like Yak Aharonov and so on. When you make Pope pre and post measurements, you see, and when you, you have data pre and post, then you have sort of a time symmetric picture. But it's not the way we do measurements normally, mm -hmm. because the measurement is not symmetric in time. And it does that, does that come about because the universe is not symmetric in time? Or is it because the theory is basically not symmetric in time? And certainly the way we do it is not. The probabilities don't work the other way around. I mean, I, I, I know I often point, maybe that's the sort of thing that Landau and Lischitz were saying. I, I can't remember what they say in their volumes. But certainly if you try to apply the, what do you call the, the, the Born rule, in the past direction, mm -hmm. you get the wrong answer. It's nonsense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you only get the correct answer applying the Born rule in the future. Mm -hmm. So is there a way in which it makes sense in the past? Well, you follow Aharonov and his colleagues, and then you put a you sort of force the situation mm -hmm. so you've got past and future uh, constraints, and you can formulate it in such a way that it looks time symmetric. I'm not quite sure how useful I regard that as, 
because certainly the way we do measurements in actual practice, you don't have this past selection procedure. So it's the Bourne rule only works in the future. Um, is that a deep part of physics? Is it that the collapse of the wave function, which gives you the Bourne rule, is really a time asymmetric scheme? Or is it that something which, because the universe is time asymmetric, yeah, yeah. It forces you into a time asymmetric. Oh, so they're related, but what is the reason for what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you see, it's not obvious to me because the CCC picture is very time asymmetric. No. And it sort of propagates itself in a time asymmetric way without ever referring to the measurement issue. It doesn't say measurement at any stage. So maybe it's independent. Maybe measurement gets its time asymmetry from the asymmetry of the CCC picture, which somehow propagates itself in this time asymmetrical way. Now, is that independent of the way that measurement is time asymmetric? I mean, does it force the asymmetry onto it or is it deeply connected with it? My guess is it's deeply connected with it, but I don't have a theory which says that. <laughs> so I, I, my answer to your question is don't know, I'm afraid. Yeah. Don't know. Thank, thank you. <laughs> okay, the last question. Okay, this is a question from Paul Robert uh, Schauder, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Frindrose, for your patience and for your talk. Um, you. a, a very naive question, please. Um, I know that general relativity does not give us dynamical topological changes, but why are we to expect that there is no topology change when we go from one aeon to the next, please? Thank you. That's a good question. The main question is you can't do it without singularities. Um, I mean, it doesn't CCC does not say what the topology of the universe is. It might not, you see, it might be spherical, three sphere, especially. It might be flat, it might be hyperbolic, it might be identified in some way with wormholes and goodness knows what, in a complicated way. I so see no evidence for this. I have been puzzling about ideas which might let, lend some insight into that. It doesn't answer the question. Um, you're asking about topology change. See, topology change couldn't happen without some nasty uh, singularities in this, when I say that in the causal structure. I mean, there are theorems about, uh, well, if you have a Cauchy surface, um, you certainly can't change the topology. You could imagine some horrible thing going on which did create wormholes, I don't know, they'd have to, you, you'd have to do something pretty drastic on the, on the uh, quantum scale, which, which without having singularities, and certainly you'd have to have violation of Cauchy development. So when you, you have um, initial value problem, I mean, that's a theorem of Bob Gorach, which tells you that if you have a Cauchy surface, you, have, you don't have topology change. Um, but of course you might say you don't have that. It would change our picture. You have places where the universe behaves very differently from what we experience, which would look like what we call singularities perhaps. It would certainly be a deviation from the picture which I'm presenting. Whether things like that happen in black holes, again, that would be a deviation from what we expect because there you have inside black holes, you have things collapsing and not much time to do anything serious. So you have a certain amount of time. A very big black hole, you could go, go in it and as I say, play lots of games of cards. <laughs> but that doesn't tell you whether topology changes. Could your topology change inside a black hole? It would deviate from, from um, the standard pictures that we have, and you wouldn't have a kosher surface. But do you need one? It differs from the sort of picture that I have, but it's not saying that you can't have it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Still, we have 
One more question, a question from Alexander Wigman. Sasha, please. Uh, I am really sorry for, for being that late. I was waiting till my, till my one year old will stop screaming. Uh, thanks a lot for this wonderful talk and uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, I'm just, I was always very much puzzled about the statement that the black hole can completely evaporate because uh, what would happen with the singularity uh, inside? Because it's an end of time singularity and then after that, they're supposed to, so basically there is first end of time singularity and then there's supposed to be a moment of time when the black hole would disappear completely. How we should think about it or how do you think about it? Thanks a lot. Sorry for this late question. Yes, well, I did have a, I can't move my slides anymore, so it doesn't work. But I did have that uh, previous picture in which I showed a conformal, um, conformal diagram of an evaporating black hole according to just the well this take the um Oppenheimer Snyder model with complete symmetry of course it's going to be much more complicated but the speculation which I certainly presented for a long time and still probably believe is that your singularities are <clears throat> space-like in the future well they're both the ones in the past uh, seem to be space-like, and the ones in the future also space-like. The one in the past seems to be very smooth, singularity. The one in the future seems to be still space-like, but wildly diverging curvature. Now, if you fall into a black hole, um, you see, I don't think of that as an infin that it's infinity. That's quite soon. When I say it's a long time. You might have a long time to play lots of games of, of uh, poker or something. Um, it might be a few years. I don't know how long you have in the really biggest supermassive black holes. It's a reasonable length of time before you hit the singularity. But according to the general picture we expect is you would be start getting enormous tidal forces and become very unpleasant. And as Stephen Hawking used to say, get spaghettified stretched into whatever it is. I don't know, we'll get, but that would not be pleasant at all. But that information seems to get destroyed on the singularity. I don't see any prospect for that being repeated outside. That's many people who like to say somehow it, it, it um, I don't know, you, you, you seem, they seem to like to get it to repeat it outside, but that seems to be violation of no cloning and such, such things. Um, but it doesn't make much difference in the CCC picture because either the, the singularity destroys the information and that's just the end. And there's no future to it because it's just wildly by diverging. It's not a big bang. It's not like continuing into another universe, at least not of any kind I can see. Maybe it continues backwards in time into another collapse or something, but it doesn't help very much. But in the Hawking point, that because things happen so late, it's, if you use, let me put it another way, if you use the metric for the post Big Bang metric, that would be less than a, much, much less than a Planck scale. So if you're looking for what influence it has on the next eon, it's smaller than a Planck scale. So that if that feeds into the next eon, it doesn't do anything we can talk about. And if you like, with the analysis, which I was trying to say that Christoph Meisner had been working on, and that you treat the next eon as a collapsing universe for a while before you get into trans dynamics, you don't have to worry much about what happens. I don't know, I can't answer the question because nobody really knows. Um, Thanks a lot. That's, that's a note, a, a long-winded don't know. <laughs> great, great. That's important for all of us because we do have to work on something, you know, and that's good to know that it's not known. Oh, yeah. No, that's not, okay. Not, no, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. I think we have to stop. Uh, thanks, Roger, for fantastic talk and uh, 
very important and very a fantastic uh, answer to uh, all our questions. So uh, his answers are very stimulating and I think uh, it will be very helpful for most of us. So Roger, thank you very much for, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>